Ei te rangatira, e Mark, uh, tēnā koa mā tō mihi mahana ki a tātou. Ke te tū ao ki te tuku he mihi ki a koutou te mana whenua, ngai tahu tangata, ngai tahu iwi. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Well, it is a real treat to be here, um, not only um, be as the Minister of Health, but also because it's great to have such prestigious and important events happening in the finest electorate in the country. <laughs> Send my welcome also to those people who've journeyed south from Auckland uh, and the distinguished professors that have come from abroad. Um, Professor Redding and Wareham, it is a real treat to have you here. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, from the outset the work uh, led by the Edgar Diabetes and Obesity Research Centre and the Healthier Lives National Science Challenge and the leadership of Sir Eon Edgar and Professor Jim Mann. I'm very pleased to be here to open this event, hosted by these two leading national research organisations which are collaborating to tackle a major health issue for New Zealand. We know that diabetes represents a significant burden in our communities with Māori, Pacific, Indian, Asian and populations living in poverty disproportionately impacted. Currently 7% of New Zealand adults have type 2 diabetes. In addition, a quarter of our adult population is estimated to have pre-diabetes. Without preventative action, many of these people, of course, are likely to go on to develop diabetes. And the prevalence of diabetes in New Zealand has continued to rise over the period uh, 2010 to 2016, especially in these ethnicities, although the rate of increase has slowed in the last few years. Everyone uh, has a connection to diabetes. My own mother actually worked in diabetes prevention and care in South Auckland during the latter part of her medical career. Uh, but my formative engagement with diabetes came in interactions with my grandmother, when I was a, a preschool child. Grandma Lester was born in 2010 and had diabetes type 1 from the age of 26. So uh, in her case, had insulin not been discovered and developed in 1921, she would have died. I would never have met her. She followed doctor's orders and survived to the age of 70, although she was blind and of course along the way had to have toes amputated uh, with gangrene. My earliest memories of my grandmother were playing shops with um, those kind of cardboard uh, tea bag boxes and the old yogurt bottles, the, plastic, the round plastic ones that people can cast their minds back. Um, yeah, we, we played shops and, and I can also remember her preparing for her injections. It's one of my earliest memories. And my mother, um, when I was talking about this with her, reminded me uh, of her experience. She remembers as a seven-year-old using Ames tablets and test tubes with urine to decide how many units of insulin that her grandmother, her mother, uh, required for the next injection. It was part of what the family uh, were engaged in. During the war and the depression, my grandmother was given extra fat cream because she couldn't have calories from sugar. And that evidently um, impacted on her cardiovascular health. In her post-mortem, it was found that um, you know, she had clearly had uh, many heart attacks. Um, well, and on that front, thank goodness for modern science and the continued innovation that improves people's lives uh, today. Although health inequalities um, today do mean that not everyone can access um, the kinds of innovations available um, today, and Mark was using one that not everyone can access currently. Um, as Health Minister, I am someone who is interested in equity, and I'll be interested to hear more about how uh, the Edgar research effort and the uh, Healthier Lives Science Challenge are tackling the challenges presented by gene environment interactions, social determinants uh, of obesity, strategies for prevention and life course approaches within indigenous communities. The ageing population and people living longer with diabetes contributes to the increased prevalence of this condition. As we all know, diabetes has a major impact on the health system costing around 11% of the health budget annually. And I note that um, 
Thank you, Sir Eon. Uh, with my associate finance hat on as much as with my health hat on. Uh, because diabetes also contributes to a nationwide loss of productivity, higher benefit payments and hardship for individuals and their whanau. Recent mortality data shows that Māori and Pacific peoples are five to seven times more likely to die from diabetes-related cause than other population groups. The, ministers, the Ministry's Diabetes Plan, Living Well with Diabetes, a plan for people at high risk of living with diabetes 2015 to 2020, provides a medium-term plan to tackling diabetes and ensures that all New Zealanders with diabetes or at risk of developing type 2 diabetes are living well and have access to high-quality, people-centred health services. Obesity is a serious issue that needs tackling. A third of all New Zealand children and two-thirds of adults are overweight or obese, with New Zealand ranked third in the OECD for obesity, just behind the United States and Mexico. We know that the high prevalence of obesity is likely to increase the rate of diabetes in the future. In 2016, the Ministry published updated clinical weight management guidelines for New Zealand adults, and I would like to acknowledge Professor Mann's uh, role in chairing the technical advisory group that supported the update of these guidelines. Thank you very much, Jim. One of the key messages in those guidelines is that people do not become obese overnight. We need to encourage and support regular monitoring of weight in primary care, together with early intervention and advice if someone is trending toward becoming overweight or obese, rather than waiting until they are, over, they are obese to intervene. Small changes earlier in life may be all that's required in some cases uh, to prevent future excess weight. The second key challenge, uh, and sorry, the second key change in the guidelines is the inclusion of sleep. Um, sleep is an area of increasing research interest, and I know that Otago University has been contributing to the growing evidence base on sleep and its influence on our eating behaviours and choices, physical activity levels and weight. And I was discussing earlier with Sir, Sir Eon at an earlier event today uh, the uh, insight that um, wearing a Fitbit for a week has given me <laughs> into sleep patterns. I thought I was doing a lot better than I am. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that, that monitoring and that um, uh, focus on improving our own lives and having better information is something I think we're going to see a lot more of and it is incredibly valuable and I have to also tip my hat to see Sir Eon who cleaned me up in the, uh, in the, in the charts of how many steps we'd taken during the week. Um, he is truly uh, leading the cause from the front. Last year the Ministry uh, also published new guidelines for physical activity in children and young people and for under fives, sit less, move more, sleep well. We were the first country in the world to introduce sleep into our physical activity guidelines for under fives. However, I acknowledge the support that we received from a partnership that we have developed with Canada and Australian researchers who were also working on new integrated guidelines for the early years in their countries. Both of their guidelines were released at the end of last year. And the Canadians also granted us permission to adopt their guidelines for children and young people aged 5 to 18 years. Our collaboration has meant that all three countries have consistent messages and I understand further that the UK will also be considering the inclusion of sleep in their next children's guidelines. This is a great example of international collaboration between researchers and policy makers. The Ministry is in the process of developing a roadmap for the next five years to reduce childhood obesity, diabetes and other long-term conditions. It will have an increased focus on achieving equity in access and outcomes. I believe we must move to taking a stronger primary prevention approach to reduce the incidence of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. Establishing regular healthy eating and physical activity patterns are key to reducing obesity, preventing diabetes and <coughs> improving our overall health of children and adults over the life course. This cannot be achieved by more information alone. A comprehensive suite of approaches is required. We all know there's too much sugar in our diets, and we need to change that. Reducing mean intakes of sugar, salt, and saturated fat is part of the WHO's non-communicable diseases plan. I've arranged to meet with leading food industry companies and have asked them to outline their plans to reduce sugar levels in our processed food and drink. 
I want the industry to step up. But I'll also be clear with them when I do sit down with them very soon that I am prepared to regulate. If they do not step up, um, then we will take action. Reviewing policies for children's food environments is also in the pipeline. However, if there is not sufficient progress, we would need to look at other options. I also believe that we need better, more meaningful targets for addressing overweight and obesity. The Ministry already funds primary prevention services. Healthy Families New Zealand is a large-scale initiative that brings community leadership together to improve people's health where they live, learn, work and play by taking a dynamic systems approach to preventing chronic disease. Healthy Families New Zealand supports communities to think differently about the underlying causes of poor health and to make changes in our early childhood education settings, schools, workplaces, food outlets, sports clubs, marae, businesses, places of worship, local governments and more to create healthier environments for all. At the recent uh, Iwi Chairs Forum at Waitangi, the Healthy Families New Zealand approach was endorsed unanimously by the Iwi Chairs as an approach that is improving Māori health and reducing inequalities for groups at increased risk of chronic diseases. In addition, the Ministry of Health funds a range of primary prevention services prioritising populations with high levels of lifestyle diseases. These services are delivered by national, regional and local providers using population approaches that support communities to make healthy lifestyle changes. Services take a range of actions including advocating for environmental change so the healthy choice is an easy choice providing workforce development programs for staff promoting and supporting individual behaviour changes, and working with the food industry and catering company, companies to improve the nutrient profile of foods. The Ministry is considering a range of cross-government options for addressing declining physical activity levels in New Zealand. These include proposals intended to give effect to the World Health Organisation's Global Action Plan on Physical Activity which recognises that urgent action is needed to include health outcomes through physical activity in countries and organisations, priorities and investments. To conclude, we must work together with our international colleagues to collectively find treatments and preventions that work for all members of our society. We are part of a global community and while we strive for local solutions to these issues in New Zealand, we can learn much from those in other countries facing similar challenges. I thank you for the opportunity to address you here today and for the good work you have already done, that is well documented, as well as the good work that as Minister of Health I am looking forward to you doing, <laughs> that I expect will also be well documented. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa.